Uh, so we've been going through uh, the book of uh, Hebrews 11 and some of the histories of the scripture, uh, and we brought ourselves to Romans chapter 9, which is one of the, like these notoriously difficult passages that oftentimes Christians struggle with. And within the family of God, there's a broad spectrum of safe biblical uh, understanding and doctrine that you might come to believe, all right? And so within the family of God, uh, you might disagree with me in many points, and, and that's good, and that's godly, that's that's wonderful. You're a precious member of the body of Christ. Uh, and so please, if you happen to disagree, don't feel unwelcome in any regard. Uh, here, actually, Joe, could you turn down my mic just a little bit? Or even the red switch would work as well as just a, the full house. Uh, so, so we've been reading through some of these more challenging verses about uh, Jacob and Esau and Moses and Pharaoh and God hardening Pharaoh's heart. And that sometimes brings us to question, right? Like as we read that, maybe we would consider the fact that did God harden some individuals from before they were born unrelated to whether or not they would do good or evil uh, and that God had selected some for salvation and selected others for reprobation is the word that's used to describe this. And, and there are right Christians that believe that and, and and, you know, they're good Christians. They're godly Christians. They are studying the scriptures and coming to this conclusion. Uh, and today we're going to read another set of passages right after that, where it talks about God as a potter and that we are the clay that he is forming. And so I'm going to read this passage for us to, to consider, and then we'll try to, to consider what might it mean, and we'll look at other parts of the Bible when God uses the same kind of analogy. And so here we go, Romans chapter 9, verse 18. So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, so this is Paul speaking to a hypothetical uh, person that's disagreeing with him, why does he, that is God, still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Okay, and so Paul is saying that God in his sovereignty, in his universe, he can make the world, he can make us however he wants. And in a sense, right, we have no right to speak back to him, to disagree, to be like, God, I don't like your universe, right? Like, I want to get my own universe, right? I, I want to do things my way. I disagree with what you say about the world, about me, about yourself, about salvation. Uh, but we don't get to speak back in that way. And in the middle of this, he has this analogy about pottery and, and this person that says, Right? Why does God still find fault with me that if God made me, if God made me, if I'm one of these hardened people like Pharaoh, right? why does he consider me guilty? Who can resist God's will? All right? And so that's, that seems to be what is being described here. But, but remember, this is a criticism being presented by Paul's hypothetical opponent. Right? He's saying, you will say to me, why does God still find fault? Uh, and so it isn't necessarily affirming that this is true. The Bible isn't necessarily agreeing with what this person says. It could be, all right? It definitely could be. Uh, but I think about like the book of Job in which when Job's going through suffering, chapters and chapters of scripture are filled with Job's friends that are saying things about Job that aren't true, that are saying things about God that aren't true, and the Bible documents it, and it's true that they said it, but the Bible isn't necessarily agreeing with their, their doctrine. They're not it's not necessarily agreeing with the things that they say about God and how he establishes justice and judgment. Okay, and so it's possible, one of the ways you can interpret this passage, is that that's what Paul is saying here. He's like, someone will disagree about this whole issue of how God hardens an individual's heart. And they might say, well, then why does God find me guilty? God is the guilty one, right? God is the one that made me this. And so Paul's not necessarily agreeing with that. Paul then says, you will say, who can resist his will, right? Who could resist his will? If God made me this way and I sin, then it's God who did this through me, is essentially what that argument is saying. 
It's similar to when Adam and Eve, right, are caught in their sin, and Adam says, God, it's, it's the woman, the woman that you gave me, right, that it's trying to direct blame on God, that it's this circumstance in the garden. You're the one who put the tree here, right? I'm just an innocent bystander, right? That, that's essentially what, what they're arguing, but that doesn't mean that we're innocent when we do wrong, even though we are, right, sinners by nature, because we're also sinners by choice. In fact, Paul encounters this same type of argument and reasoning in Romans chapter 3, and I'm going to read that for you here. So Romans 3, 5, someone is asking the same kind of question. Why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And this is what it says. But if our unrighteousness, right, if my wrongdoing serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous, that he's unjust to inflict wrath on us? I'm speaking in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? And then here's another question from this opponent. But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good might come? Right? Like, God should practically thank me that I'm a sinner. Jesus would have had no one to die for if I wasn't a sinner, right? Like, he should be excited about the fact that I screw up because it makes him look more glorious. And Paul is like, no, you're, you're wrong, right? It's still just for God to judge. It's still just for God to condemn what is evil. And yes, it's still just for God to use an individual in that state, just like he used Pharaoh. And, uh, and Paul even says that some people slanderously accuse him and other Christians as saying these things like, oh, we can just sin all we want and God is glorified by it. But that's not the case. He's like, their condemnation is just. I would imagine both the people who think we can sin all we want because we're saved and the people who are right opposing Paul's teaching here where they're like, hey, God is unjust. Why am I condemned if my sin only makes him look better? And Paul's like, no, you're rightly condemned. God is holy. God can hold you to this standard, right? And, and even though he is still being glorified in the midst of it. So God is just both to condemn wickedness and to use wicked people to bring about good and for his glory. So think about Joseph and his brothers, that they sell him into slavery, and many are saved from a famine because of it. God, what they meant for evil, God used for good. And God and the scriptures can still rightly call their actions evil, right? Like we shouldn't sell our brothers into slavery, okay? Right? Like we shouldn't do that, right? And, but God is still just to use their choices to bring about good and glory in the world. And so let's go back to Romans, uh, verse 20. So Paul kind of is encountering and engaging the same type of argument. He says, but who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Okay, and so Paul, I want to point out, would agree that we have been made by God. Okay, so he's saying, yes, like all humanity has been made by God. They are image bearers. That Paul would agree that we live in him, we live and move and have our being. Or in Acts 17, he says that God created us, that he gave us breath and life and everything. And so, yes, God made us. He is the potter. We are the clay. Adam was made out of the dirt, right? And God breathed life into him. And so Paul would agree with that. And so he's, he's not disagreeing with the fact that we are made. He's just going to disagree with their argument of like, right? Why, why has God made me like this? God made me to sin. God made me to have a hard heart against him. And so they're saying, why can he condemn me? And now what's interesting is the first time this potter analogy is used in the scripture is in, in, the, in, the, in the book of Isaiah by the prophet Isaiah. Uh, and, and he actually is encountering a completely different argument. At least in Romans 9, they're agreeing that God made them. But in Isaiah's day, they actually would almost like, they wanted to sin in their own corner of the universe and pretend as though God didn't know what was going on. And so this is what Isaiah says in Isaiah 29. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are dark, and who say, who sees us? Who knows us? You turn things upside down. 
Shall the potter be regarded as the clay, that the thing made should say of its maker, he didn't make me, or the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding. And so what's interesting here is that the first time this potter analogy is used is to correct those who believe God didn't really make me. God doesn't really know who I am. I can live my life my own way. I can define who I am, and I don't have to be defined in the way that God would define me, right? Like I can live for myself, that I can hide my sins from him, right? That they they were refusing to acknowledge that God made them. And so this is the first time this potter analogy is used. No, you can't hide from the Lord. God knows every bit about you. He knows every detail about your life. He knows your future. He knows everything about you, and he loves you, and is, he's infatuated with you. God understands you. And so, yes, we are made in his image. But just because we're made in his image doesn't mean we can pretend that he is just like the clay. That we can't pretend that he is just like us in our sinful ways, right? That what Isaiah is saying here is like, God is still different. God is still unique. He is other. He is holy. And so just because you are made by God doesn't let you pretend as though like, well, God therefore must be just like me. But back in Romans 9, those who are opposed to Paul's thinking, they're saying, no, we do believe that God made us. We, we do believe that he made us, and we can't be anything other than how he made us. So why should he find us guilty? And they ask the question, why have you made me like this? Basically saying, if I have a hardened heart, if I'm someone like Pharaoh, if I'm a vessel for dishonor, it's not my fault. God did it, right? That, that, that they, they want to kind of reject the idea that they're accountable for their own actions, that God did this to them, God sinned through them, right? That, that, that's not how it works. That's not what Paul is saying. And Paul kind of steps into that argument. He says, listen, even if that was the case, let's, let's pretend that's true for a minute, right? This is called proof by contradiction, where for a minute you agree with the view that you're trying to disprove, right? They do that in geometry all the time where you're like, okay, so like, let's say this was true. He's like, but then you're saying you're this piece of pot, right? This pottery, right? And and you're telling God that he's wrong in what he's doing. Like, does that really make sense? Can the the pot say to the potter, right? Why have you made me like this? Do you really think you're going to come out on top in that argument? That's kind of the same kind of argument that Job had, even though he was a righteous man, and was experiencing all sorts of suffering, right? He was like, I need my day in court. God's doing something wrong here, right? Like, I deserve justice. And God essentially exposes the fact, he's like, right, Job, you don't know what's going on. Were you there when I made the world? Were you there when I made all of these things? Do you know the way of light, right? Do you understand the the Pleiades and all these galaxies and the way these things interact and their gravity? Like, he's like, no, you don't. And so Paul steps into that argument of like, why have you made me like this? And he ends up saying, he's like, but you're really going to use that as your argument of like, it's God's fault, but the whole time you're imagining that you were made by him and you somehow think you're going to know more than he does or that your argument is right and he is wrong. And so, yes, God made us, but we are still accountable to our choices. I can't pawn off all of my responsibility on him. All right, that I am still responsible to how I encounter and react to Jesus, to the gospel. I'm still accountable to those choices. Right? That God, like the prodigal son story, right, he will allow us to use our inheritance, right, the, the resources he's given us, the breath and life and everything he's blessed us with. He'll allow us to use our bodies that he's leased to us for sinful and blasphemous means, while the whole time desiring us to come back home, right? For the whole time, the father in the prodigal son story, waiting for the son to return, looking to the horizon for him to come back. That God will let us use his space and resources, the days that he's given us, the very breath that he's given us, he allows human creation to speak blasphemous lies against him momentarily. And he rightly calls that wrong. 
right? That's, st that's still evil. They're, we are accountable to how we use the world and the life that God has given us. Now, is that, th this is like an interesting thing to think about. Like, has God molded us in such a way, has he made us in such a way that everything about our life is predetermined and fated? Right? This is, this is where this all like comes to play, like where you've you got to consider, like, I don't know, like I know God knows our future, like I know God knows our future choices, but does that mean he made those choices for us? And this is where like we have to consider these things. Okay, if I am like a piece of pottery, a piece of clay that he's formed, in what ways does that hold true? In what ways am I accountable for my own choices? And in what ways did he choose my whole life for me? Do I have any freedom in this sense? Right? And so this is one of the things that we need to consider. Are we fated? Are our actions pre-programmed? Okay? Are we simply, as an atheist might consider, are we meat machines with no soul? Right? Are we just like electrical signals firing in a brain and a neural network? And we're just encountering this world around us. Right? Is everything determined? Do we have any accountability? And to consider that, I want to go back to the second pottery analogy in Scripture, which is in the book of Jeremiah. Because if, if we are described as humans as these inanimate objects, right, one might say, like, therefore, like, I had no choice. I'm like, I'm like this table. I can't do anything different than what the person who made it right, has chosen for my life. But let's see what God spoke through his prophets using these types of pottery analogies and try to consider, are we going too far with the analogy? So in Jeremiah 18, verse 1, and he's like about 100 years after Isaiah. The word uh, that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will let you hear my words. So I went to the potter's house and there he was working at his wheel and the vessel he was making was spoiled in the potter's hand, right? Somehow, like, I imagine you're making a piece of pottery and then it slumps over or it breaks or it, you know, it just messes up in some way. And he reworked it into another vessel. So in some way, the pottery had failed in what his original design was. And he's like, all right, well, I can still use this and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to just make it a, a, a stumpier bowl, right? Like, it's not going to be this tall vase that I was thinking. And so he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. And in this analogy, right, uh, God is speaking to Jeremiah and saying, like, God is like the potter and his people are like this clay. And in this moment, the clay is marred or spoiled in the hands of the, the potter and he reworks it into something different. And in the analogy, the prophetic analogy here, God is the potter. He is a perfect potter, right? And even an expert potter, I imagine, one out of a hundred pots that they make are going to fail, right? They're going to slump, they're going to fall apart, they're going to, right, maybe spin right off the little wheel or whatever it is, I don't know, right? That, like, it's going to fail, and it's not necessarily because of the fault of the potter. Sometimes it's just the way that the clay was formed, that it was weaker, that it couldn't sustain itself with such a thin wall, right? It's, it's essentially, it's materials engineering. Just like when we have a circuit that's designed, maybe one out of a hundred circuits fail in the factory, and it's not because it was poorly designed. It's not because they, they chose poorly in how they laid it out or how it was made. It's just that sometimes the way the materials came together, the way the copper wiring was all put, it just didn't work. And it wasn't the fault of the engineer. It's materials engineering. And so in this analogy about the clay being spoiled in the potter's hand, I think it would be wrong for us to say that God is some flawed potter in how he makes us. The fly, I'm pretty sure, lands back on, on us, the clay, all right, <laughs> is, is what I, I feel comfortable saying, right? I don't want to blame God for the flaw because he's not the cause of evil. And if the clay is flawed, if the clay is marred, the potter is then free to do what he will with what is left, okay? So he can repurpose it. He can make a different vessel out of it. And that's what God ends up saying in verse 5. The word of the Lord came to me. O house of Israel, so he's speaking to his whole people, this whole nation, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. And so he's leaning into the same analogy. 
And you might think, like, so therefore, God made Israel to rebel. God made them to worship the prophets and, you know, worship Baal and do all this pagan activity. No, 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 that's not what he lets them get away with here. Notice where he continues. If, verse 7, if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. I think the best analogy for us would be uh, the city of Nineveh in the story of Jonah, right? Where God declares he's going to destroy their city. Verse 8, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. So that's his first analogy. A, A nation that he planned on destroying, if they repent, if they turn, he'll change his purpose, just like the potter in that clay. He's like, oh, okay, I guess you're not going to be a vase. I'm going to do something else with you. And that's a good thing. And then he continues, and if at any time I declare concerning a nation or kingdom that I will build and plant it, and if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do to it. And so notice in this pottery analogy, prophetically speaking, God is saying that a nation has, has some influence on its future outcome. That if it turns from evil, it will change the end result. If it does evil, not listening to his voice, it will change the end result that God intends for it. That our choices, even as clay, can influence what the potter does with us, and he is free to do with us as he will. But notice, like, what sort of pottery is Jeremiah thinking of here? Pottery that can turn from evil, that can make good or evil choices? Pottery that has ears, that it could choose to listen to the voice of God or not? Like, he's not describing these passive pots that have no freedom to respond to their environment and their circumstances. That God hinges the outcome of the pot on the choices of the pot. That God didn't form them for destruction. He's like, listen, it's, it's up to you. Are you going to turn from evil? Or are you going to refuse to listen to my voice? And so clearly we can't take this pottery analogy too far. We can't say, well, God made me this way and it's, it's his fault. Right? I had no choice in the matter. Because if we turn, God can reform us. God can rework us. God can make us new. Amen. And he is free to do that. Verse 11, now therefore say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord. So in case like they didn't get the analogy, he's like, all right, this is is what it means. Behold, I am shaping disaster against you and devising a plan against you. Return everyone from his evil way and amend your ways and your deeds. And so God explicitly outlines the analogy here. You have the choice as to whether you will turn and I will relent from my purpose and plan to bring about your destruction. If you will turn, and he's actually saying, actually, it's a good idea. Every one of you turn from your evil way. Amend your ways. And I'll not bring this disaster on you. That God is uh, pleading with them. He's persuading them. He's, he's imploring them to make the right choice. That the end outcome of the pot is resting on their choices. Verse 12, but they say, That is in vain. We will follow our own plans and we will everyone act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. And so the response to this invitation to repentance is that, no, we're going to follow our stubborn hearts. We're going to harden our hearts. Is I think I'm free to use that language, right? They're choosing to be a stiff-necked people is what they're doing. They're, they're the ones that are limiting themselves, believing the only thing they should do is what their evil hearts would desire. And so when we read Romans 9, is, is God basically saying like, hey, if you're a hard heart, if, if you're a, a, a vessel of dishonor, like that's too bad for you, deal with it. I don't think that's what God's saying. I think God's saying, listen, if your heart's hard, you need to deal with it, right? Like, you need to turn from your evil. Like, you can still influence your future life and what I'm planning and purposing for you. That you have a degree of influence over this. Let's check out Jeremiah 19, because this gets pretty, pretty crazy. Next chapter. 
Uh, so he's further prophecy, and they're set in their ways. Then you shall break the flask in the sight of the men who go with you, and shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, So I will break this people and this city as one who breaks a potter's vessel so that it can never be mended. Men shall bury in Topheth because there will be no place else to bury. And so he's saying, like, I'm going to shatter this city, this nation, as a potter is free to discard a pot that isn't, isn't the way that they want it to. Skipping down to verse 15, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I am bringing upon this city and upon all its towns the disaster that I have pronounced against it. And notice, what does it hinge upon? Because he made them for destruction? Because he made them to be sinful and wicked and to be stubborn in their own ways? No, it hinges on this. Because they have stiffened their neck, refusing to hear my words. And so when would the Lord break a pot beyond mending. It's when someone hardens their own heart repeatedly and is unrepentant. When someone refuses to listen to the voice of the Lord over and over and over, right? Or as Romans 1, Paul would say, when someone suppresses the truth in unrighteousness, that God will eventually turn them over to their sin. And it's like, all right, you've made this choice. You're walking this path. I'm going to let you do it. And God is free to use that vessel as a means that he wants, even if it means bringing good news to those who would listen, right? Even if it means bringing hope to others. And now, one thing to consider is that, yes, God knows when a person is broken beyond mending. But do we know that? I don't, I don't think we do. I don't think we ever do in this life. We don't know when a person's broken beyond mending, and we should be very careful to ever make that claim. Because God is tremendously wonderful and powerful when he, comes, when he comes into someone's life and fixes the broken, right? God is a master craftsman when he takes a screwed up individual and repairs them into this glorious way that, that points to him and his work in them. And so, like, we can't just say, like, oh, that person's too broken for God to work with. No, we don't know. We don't know when someone's at that state. And so we continue to hold out hope, just like Paul in Romans 9, that he loves his brethren, that he prays for them. He desires to see their hearts soft and to see them come to God by faith and experience the righteousness that can only come by faith. And so that's what we'll continue to do. And we are stories of God being able to mend broken lives and broken pottery, right? Like God's able to do it. But God also knows the end result, and he's, he's able to, like with Pharaoh, Use that person's life, even when they are a marred pot for his glory in some other way. And so we don't, we don't give up hope. Uh, and actually, even when it comes to shattered pottery, if we skip back to Isaiah, verse 30 this time, uh, I'm going to pick up at verse 12. Uh, he says, Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and rely on them, therefore this iniquity shall be to you like a breach in a high wall, bulging out and about to collapse, whose breaking comes suddenly and in an instant. And its breaking is like that of a potter's vessel that is smashed so ruthlessly, that among its fragments not a shard is found with which to take fire from the hearth or to dip up water out of the cistern. For thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in returning, you could even say in repenting and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and trust shall be your strength. But you were unwilling. And so when God gets to the point of shattering the pot, it's not because he designated them for that purpose. It's because they were unwilling. They were refusing to listen to his words. That you can read earlier in that chapter and see that that's the case. And what's, what's his desire? He's like, return, repent, find rest in me and be saved. In quietness and trust will be your strength. That's the life and freedom that he's offering. But eventually, if a person repeatedly rejects that that God's free to do as he will, and he's just to do so. So one, one of the things to think about is that, like, oftentimes when we read this potter analogy, especially in Romans 9, it sounds as though it's like, well, God's comparing me to an inanimate object. 
And therefore, it feels appropriate for me to say that I have, I have no will, right? I have no freedom. I have no choice in my life. And many times throughout Scripture, God compares humans to inanimate objects, right? Jesus says, right, the salt that loses its flavor isn't worth anything except to be cast on the ground, trampled underfoot. Or he compares people to uh, a lost coin that God seeks after and pursues and rejoices over when he finds it. Or he compares people to, I guess this isn't necessarily inanimate because it's organic, but tares and wheat or fish that are hauled in through a net, right? And so like when we read moments like that, it might be like, oh, so I guess I'm just a lost coin waiting to be found, right? Like I have no real choice. I'm just a piece of pottery and, and I can't do anything different. But we got to be careful with taking analogies too far because God himself describes himself and through the psalmist and the prophets, he describes himself as inanimate objects. And one of the best verses I can find that hits a whole bunch of these in one go is in uh, Psalm, uh, is it 18? Actually, Joe, I don't think I have that on my notes here. Do you have it up there? Psalm 18? Maybe a, it's not there. Oh, he found it. Good man, Joe. All right, here it goes. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. So God is a rock, okay? Uh, <laughs> my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. And so over and over and over here, God is compared to inanimate objects, literally a rock. Does that mean that God has no ability, no power, no freedom? No means of action, that he's just this passive shield that I'm like, ah, well, I guess I could pick this up and use it to defend myself if I want. Or he's, you know, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, it talks about in Proverbs. Like, like I guess, like, God's just this passive tower, and i got to choose whether or not I'm going to find safety in this tower or not. Like, no, just because God is described as an inanimate object does not mean that he isn't mighty. Right? God is powerful, he is sovereign, he is able to act. And just because we are described as inanimate objects doesn't remove our accountability. It doesn't remove our responsibility, our ability to respond to the gospel message and what Jesus has done for us, that we are able to respond. And just in case we're still unsure from Romans 9, Paul himself uses this same pottery analogy in 2 Timothy. And he's not talking about salvation, so I want to make sure, like, I'm not tricking you, I'm not, you know, moving the, the pee between the cups here, okay? He's talking about sanctification, he's talking about those who are already saved, and he leans once again into this potter and clay analogy. And check out what he says. Uh, let's see, I'll pick up in verse 19, 2 Timothy 2, 19. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing the seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So this is describing people in the family of God. We're not talking salvation here. They're already saved. Verse 20, now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable use. And so you might think like Paul's going to say, well, too bad. If God didn't mean you to accomplish much for his kingdom, that's, that's, that's too bad. That's how he made you. But no, notice what Paul says. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. And so Paul uses the same exact potter analogy, and he doesn't use it as a means of removing any responsibility or accountability in our choices and in our lives. He's like, listen, if you're a dishonorable pot right now, he doesn't say, that's too bad, you're stuck, that's how God made you. He says, no, like, cleanse yourself from these dishonorable things. What, what kind of pottery is Paul thinking of? Like, self-washing pots? Like, that sounds awesome, right? Like, we've got dishwashers nowadays, but, like, how can a pot do that? And then, like, Paul argues here, he's like, you are supposed to be active in your relationship with Jesus, that you are to cleanse yourself from these dishonorable things and that God will then, right, use you in honorable ways, right, that you will be prepared for every good work. The next verse, 22, he says, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. 
And so what's Paul imagining here? A pot with legs that can run away when youthful lust comes around? Or that it can pursue after righteousness? And so he, he uses this pottery analogy, but he's in no way suggesting that we can just now sit back and be passive recipients of God's grace or God's condemnation. Right? He's, he's not saying as though like we have no responsibility to, to work with the Holy Spirit right, in our sanctification. Okay? And so there are times in which it would be inappropriate to, to take this analogy too far. And so, back to Romans 9, verse 21. Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Yeah, God has that right. God has that freedom. If we, like Pharaoh, harden our hearts repeatedly, God's able to be like, all right, like, I'm still going to use you. I'm still going to make my name famous throughout the nations. My grace will be made known to people like Rahab, right? Like, I'm going to use you, Pharaoh. Just because you're resisting me and hardening your heart doesn't mean I'm going to abandon my omnipresence. I'm not going to evacuate your little corner of the universe so you can do your thing. I still have the right to use you, <laughs> right? Like, or I'm not going to abandon my omniscience. I'm not going to forget everything about you and evacuate your space so that you can think your own way and do your own thing and hide your own sin. No, nope, I'm still going to know everything about you. Right? I can still use you. The potter has the right to use the clay even when it is marred. Right? That, that he's allowed to do that. And so what is the conclusion from something like this? Let, let's go back to Jeremiah 18 where I take the implication of that whole passage. And I'm definitely reworking it here. So if you're like, Brian, you're twisting scripture. I don't know. I don't think so. But you study it yourself. Here we go. Right? Basically, this is what God was saying back in Jeremiah 18. Return everyone from his evil way and amend your ways and deeds. And earlier he said that God will rework you into another vessel as it seems good to the potter to do. Right? He's inviting them to turn and repent and God will make you new. God will purpose you for something good. Or in Isaiah 30, what did he say? Right? That in returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. That he's speaking to those who are pots and he's like, listen, this is how you can experience this life. This is how you can experience this freedom and this purpose that I have for you. This is a good thing and a good gift that I have for you. I'm inviting you to this. Right? This is what I need you to do. And so let's go, lastly, to 2 Corinthians, let's see, 5. And what do I got? Verse 17. There it is. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That when we come to Christ, when we receive him as our Lord and Savior, he makes us brand new. There's now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That God, he turns us into his, his workmanship, this, this treasured vessel for good works that he foreordained before we were born. Right? That God has this plan and purpose for our life, and he makes us completely new. That our desires will begin to shift. And sometimes it's immediate, and others it takes a while as we have this battle with our flesh. Right? But we begin to want to please the Lord that he makes us a new creation. Verse 18, all this is from God, who Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling, reuniting the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us this message of reconciliation, that God wants us, his right pottery used for good works, honorable vessels, to bring this message of hope to others. That he wants us to reconcile the world to him. He wants us to go out and, and appeal to them, plead with them, reason with them, is what Paul would do, to invite them into relationship. Verse 20, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Right? Just like Jeremiah, just like Isaiah, just like Paul, they're saying, please, right? you can turn, you can trust, and God will make you new. Right? Place your hope in God. 
right? Please be reconciled to God. Verse 21, for our sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so when we read passages like this, I just want to point out, right, we plead with people to respond to the message of hope in the gospel, right? That's how God pursued us as well, both through his word, through his spirit, through the church, as people came to us to seek us out. And there's genuine responsibility on the part of the hearer to respond, right? That God is pleading with them through us to bring them to the point of repentance and life and newness of creation. And so we'll have uh, Rennell come back up here and we'll pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that God, you do work in our lives, that you are not passive, that you are not an absent God who's left his creation on its own, that God, you are working in us uh, to will and to do for your good pleasure, uh, that, Lord, you are active in us, that, let, that you who began a good work in us will bring it to completion. I thank you, Father God, that you seek to save the lost, that, Lord, you are not just passively waiting for people to find you, but no, God, you seek them out, and you use us. You've given us the ministry of reconciliation that you've given us the, the great commission to go into all the world and to preach the gospel, to invite people to life and forgiveness and freedom and repentance. And so, Lord, I just ask that, God, you would stir us up, Lord God, that we would be instructed, like Paul said to Timothy, to, to flee youthful lust, to set aside, to cleanse ourselves from the things that are dishonorable and to, to pursue, to seek after your righteousness. I desire, God, to see you use your church, uh, that we would be a people of hope, that we would be a beacon in our community, that, Lord, people would come to know and trust you, and that you would make them new creations as only you can. And we pray this in Jesus' name.